Hey guys, and welcome to Petroped. Now, the Renault Scenic is a car that's been around a long time. And behind me is the new Renault Scenic. But by all accounts, the only thing that that car has in common with its predecessors is its name. It is a completely new ground up platform. And I think it's got some really exciting technology on board. And it's just won Car of the Year 2024. So, that should make it quite good, right? First up, before any of you dive into the comments and make some nasty comments about my legs, it's sunny, I had to put my shorts on. Anyway, let's get back to the cars. A few months ago, I travelled to Paris for a preview of the new Renault 5. In my book, one of the most exciting EVs to come to market so far. That car, from a styling point of view, just looks fantastic. But it's not with us yet. The current all-electric Renault range includes Zoe, Megan, and now the Scenic. And this car takes an awful lot of trickle down or trickle up, whichever way you want to put it, from Megan, but has some really exciting technology on board. I've got a very short period of time with the car today to get my head around it, but I want to show you and, and explain to you some of the headline figures. First up, from a styling point of view, I like it. I really like the front end. This new Renault badge is growing on, on me a great deal. And then this detailing around where traditionally in an internal combustion engine car, we would have seen a grill and radiators. I think that's a really nice touch. And then moving down the side of the car, you can start to see lots of aero touches. The wheels might not be to your taste. These aero blades are removable, by the way. But by all accounts, those aero blades add something like 20 miles of range to this car. And we'll get onto range and charging and battery sizes very shortly. But the range is very impressive. Class leading, actually. So let's take a bit of a look around the car and I'll point out to you some of the details that have caught my eye. So as I walk around the car trying to soak up all the details, quite an interesting door handle design. They do go flush when the car's running. There's a little kind of cover there. You have to put your finger in there and then pull the handle out. That's quite interesting. I think it's one of those things you get the knack with. This car is in Arctic white and it's got a black roof and black trim. I think that goes really well. Walking around the back now, there are two wheel size options, a 19 inch on the base model, and then the next two models have 20 inch wheels, as we see on here. And it's shod with Michelin E Primacy tires, which I'm very pleased about. But the design is a combination of some smooth lines and some quite defined creases, which I like a lot. I particularly like details like this. There's this, it's almost like a little winglet that comes out here on the rear three quarter really nice tail light design. And again, on the rear boot lid, you've got this black privacy glass and then a really angular kind of boot. It just gives interest. The thing I really like about this car though, is it's really simple to buy because there are no options that you can spec. There are three trim levels. It starts with Techno, then there's Esprit Alpine, and then there's this, the iconic edition. So you choose your trim levels and then you choose your color and that's it. Now in terms of battery and charging, if we just open the charge port, it supports up to 22 kilowatts AC charging and 150 kilowatts DC charging. Now there are two battery sizes, comfort and long range. The comfort is a 60 kilowatt hour battery coupled to a 170 horsepower motor. And then the long range is an 87 kilowatt hour and that's got a 220 horsepower motor. So this, this is the long range version. You can only get comfort in the base techno spec. So choice wise, techno spec, you can choose comfort or long range, and then Esprit Alpine and Iconic, it's just long range only with a 220 horsepower. And the WLTP range figure for the long range model, this one, is over 370 miles. Now, you know me with WLTP, I think that's a little bit on the high side, but even if you were to look at a 
an efficiency figure of four, four and a half, I think 300 miles definitely possible, maybe a little bit more than that. And there's a really interesting driver coach on the dash that will help you optimize how you drive, maximize your efficiency and your range. But a really good amount of range and with 150 kilowatt DC charging, even after 250 miles of, let's say, motorway driving, you're probably ready for a brake pop in, stick it on a rapid charger, have a coffee, have a comfort brake, and you'll have a couple of hundred miles of motorway mile range stuck in the car in, let's say, half an hour or so. So it makes that a really usable proposition. Now this is definitely aimed at the family car market and therefore practicality is very, very important. And therefore it has a really big boot. Not quite class leading. I think Skoda Enyaq's boot is a little bit bigger, but with the seats up 545 liters. But if you drop the rear seats, just short of 1700 liters of space in the boot. You can drop the central portion down to act as a ski hatch as well, if that's something you need. And then underneath you've got a false floor and you can configure that. At the moment there's like little partitions so you can put stuff in there so they don't move around or you could take that out altogether and just have a deeper floor. So I quite like the way that that's been configured. But safe to say from a storage point of view, putting stuff in it, a very, very practical car. Now, rather amusingly, when I arrived today, I was chatting to the press team from uh, Renault and they said, whatever you do when you're out driving, make sure you find a tall person and get them to sit in the back. And I'm thinking, well, I am a tall person, so I don't need to find anybody. There's a huge amount of space in here. This is class leading space. EV architecture, so completely flat floor, no transmission tunnel and loads of room. And this seat is set for me as a driver, so it's a long way back. The pan roof in here, it's not called a pan roof, it's called a solar bay roof. I'll talk more about it when I'm in the driver's seat, but it's got the ability to change its opacity and you can do that either as a whole roof or in sections, which I think is a really very clever idea. And I also wanted to show you this. So this central part of the seat folds down. We've all seen this in cars before, central armrest, maybe a couple of cup holders, but this one has a trick. So if I lift this up, first off, there's a, there's a couple of USB um, points in there to power stuff. There's a little tray there to put things. But then you've got these two things. They spin around and they've got this lovely feel to them, really tactile feel. And you spin them around there and the idea is you could place your smartphone like that or a, maybe a tab like that if you were watching a movie and you could put your cable run here to power the device. I like that a lot. It's just clever engineering, really smart. Um, so that, and it does, I don't know what they've done to these the way those spin round, but it just feels lovely. Um, and then you can, there's a ski hatch there, as I mentioned already. So that, that's very clever design. I like that a lot. So let's fire the car up so we can bring the screens to life as well. I need to say for me at the moment, Renault, their interior design team are smashing it out of the park. I love what they've done with the new Renault 5. And this car on the inside just is so different to many, many things out there. Yes, there's a couple of big touchscreens, but the way they're oriented, you've got the main instrument cluster in front of you, which is very angular and similar in terms of screen design to Renault 5. And then you've got this portrait screen there, but the way it's integrated into the dash is really nice. And you've got some real physical buttons there for climate control. And then there's lots of little things that I like. The, in terms of behind, the, the gear selector is very similar to the one in Renault 5, but that was quite heavily borrowed from again anyway. You've got the normal Renault stereo controls on its own stalk behind. So you do have four stalks behind the steering wheel, which is a little bit busy, but relatively intuitive, I think. Steering wheel is really nice. But you know, in, in modern day cars, you've got all of these safety systems like lane departure assist, the speed bong, the things I moan about in lots and lots of cars. And nowadays, they're all modern day safety requirements that manufacturers have to put into cars, where you have to get in and then you go into about five menus of screen and all of that kind of stuff. 
The really nice thing about the Scenic is it has a system called Safety Shield. So, you know with drive modes in lots of cars, you can go into an individual mode. Well, basically you can go into the driver safety systems and you can set up your own profile, the things you want on and the things you want off, because by law, they have to all come on when you start the car. But what you can do is you set up your individual profile and then there is one physical button just here when you get in start the car hit that button and that goes into your safety individual setting that is a genius idea so simple but it just makes life so easy some of you will want all those systems on many of you will want them all turned off there's a huge amount of google integration with this car um, so it's a car that you talk to uh, there's some 70 commands that you can use with google and they've done a lot of work, especially in terms of the navigation and mapping systems. So it uses Google Maps, but if you plug in a destination that's in excess of the car's range, it's got some really clever, pretty standard on something like a Tesla, but really great routing. It will find you charge stops. It's plugged into the charge network. It knows what bays are free, what are working and so on. And it will even get to precondition the battery so that by the time you get to your charge point, the car's at its optimum temperatures and so on for the fastest possible charging. And I like that a lot. There are also a whole bunch of widgets and apps that you can download so that you can go onto the internet and you can watch Netflix or YouTube or whatever and have an entertainment space while you're charging. I'm probably not going to test that so much in the short time I've got the car today. Uh, that's something I'd want a car for a bit longer to really kind of get my head around it, especially the long distance route planning and the long distance charge planning, because if you've got that right, that just removes so much range anxiety. Um, in terms of range, this car is 100% charged and it's showing an indicated range of 370 miles. So even if you took a bit of that off, 300 miles is definitely doable on that one. So I think that's really interesting. Wow. That's <laughs> so clever. So I think um, we need to get out and do some driving because as I said, I don't have this car for very long. Okay, let's go out for a drive. Now I'll start from the very beginning. If we just turn the car on, uh, gear selector on the steering column, we mentioned that before, and then we'll just head off. Now, I don't know whether you'll be able to hear it. So, the, this car is so French. The slow speed exterior audible, audible warning that you have to have in terms of um, cars these days has been designed by Jean-Michel Jarre. I mean, how French is that? And actually all of the sounds, the startup sound, all of that is Jean-Michel Jarre. And I think that is so typically French. Sadly, unlike the Renault 5, there is no baguette holder in this car. But let's, I'm gonna drive it for a bit and then we'll turn the cameras on and we'll start talking through what I think of the car. Okay, I've done a few miles instant impressions. First up, there's a huge amount of reach and tilt adjustment in the steering wheel, which I really, really like. As a long-legged driver, I often find it difficult to get my legs and my arms in the right or comfortable position. I've got my seat quite a long way back to get my legs comfortable, but the steering wheels come really nice and close just where I like it. So that's really nice. I've started off in comfort mode, um, and even in comfort mode, there's a good amount of response on the throttle and there are two paddles behind the steering wheel where you can adjust your regenerative braking and I've got regen braking on its maximum just to see what that's like and it is pretty close to one pedal driving. I lift off here, I'm not using the foot brake at all. Quick check in the mirrors, I'm going to turn left here. But yeah, so no foot brake at all and I'm actually going to stop short of the roundabout. That was all on regen braking. So that's really good. Now clearly once you open up onto a road like this you can flick that back and reduce its aggressiveness but really nice setting. 
I like the displays a lot. Um, I mean, it's one of these things, you could go into this, I'm sure, spend hours and hours going through all the different possible options. The satellite navigation, we're using Google Maps, that's a really nice clear display. And it's got, we've got waypoints in there for the route we're doing today, but my next waypoint is in eight miles and 12 minutes, and it's giving me a battery percentage that I'll be at when I get to that waypoint, which is just the kind of thing you want. That integration between the car and the sat-nav, I like that a lot very Tesla and that's a big compliment and then on the dash at the moment I've got a uh, miles per kilowatt hour reading and I'm kind of averaging anywhere between three and a half to four so far it clearly depends how much you press the fast pedal but if you're just driving at normal road speeds and not pushing on too much it seems like three and a half or so is pretty good I need to be north of four to get that 350 odd miles of range i think that's pretty healthy brakes feel good and in comfort mode as i said nice and responsive 220 uh, horsepower uh, i love the roof um it's a very clever bit of technology it is only available though in the iconic edition the most expensive one we'll talk money in a moment um which is a shame because there was an uh, Alpine edition, uh, or Esprit Alpine, uh, parked in the car park. And I actually prefer the looks of that. It's got a little A badge for Alpine on the side. The wheel design is much nicer than this, in my humble opinion. And it's the middle of the range in terms of price, but unfortunately you can't spec the lovely Solar Bay roof. Now I must say, the materials choice in this car is excellent. This is the top spec, so you would expect a premium feel. But everything you touch has just got that feeling of quality and some really nice choices. I love the material on the dash, the steering wheel feels lovely. But the amazing thing is 25% of the materials used to make this car are recycled. And 90% of the car's mass, including the battery, is recyclable. So yeah, I like that a lot. A really nice eco message about this car. I spy a National 60, so I'm going to go from comfort mode, I'm going to go up into the sport mode, the dash turns red, the surround on the main console turns red, and instantly I've got a sharper throttle response. So let's just, quite like the noise on acceleration, there's a little kind of whine, and then the car feels much more sprightly. Even at slow speeds, it's got really quite a sharp steering. Lock to lock, it's, it's a much shorter number of turns lock to lock than you'd normally find. It's got quite a good turning radius as well. But what that means is you don't have to turn the steering wheel a great deal to get action on the front axle. And that just makes it feel really sharp and really sporty and edgy. But it's quite a clever trick because when you're in comfort mode on a normal road, what you don't want is fidgety steering and it doesn't feel like that at all. But as soon as you're on a nice bit of road and you can just open the taps a little bit and push on a little bit, it has a really nice feeling. Almost the quicker you go, the more confidence inspiring and the more competent the car feels. And actually down a nice bit of road like this, it has a really nice turn of pace. The brakes are really good, but as I said, I've got the regen up quite high so all I need to do really for a corner like this is a little bit of a lift off then back on the power and it's 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 good yeah you wouldn't I don't think you'd go and buy one of these cars to be an out and out sports car but it, it's got enough performance to keep even the the petrol head in the family happy because my gut feel for this car says that this is going to be or potentially a family's only car and it needs to do lots of things, right? It needs to have the practicality side of things squared away. We talked about how much luggage and stowage there is in this car, but you also want that, that performance too. Now, I've just pulled over briefly because I wanted to talk about price and spec. Now, the new Scenic, uh, the base model 
with the short range battery starts at 37 and a half thousand pounds and goes all the way up to this so the car we sat in is is pretty much as much money as you're going to spend so the on the road price for this car is 56 and a half thousand pounds but then the paint work on this car remember all you need to do is choose the trim level and the paint the paint is 1250 quid so the car we sat in as tested 46750 pounds for the spec and the range and the level of equipment, I think that's not bad money. If you compare it with the market, it's there or thereabouts. I'm sure many of you are going to say that's too much money for normal people. And I kind of agree we're in that world, though, unfortunately. So please don't shoot the messenger in the comments. But I reckon we finish up this video by going for a road a drive down the road in front of me because it looks quite good. I'm in sport mode and i am quite impressed with this car's turn of pace because on paper you look at it and it it doesn't have a huge amount of horsepower it's a relatively heavy electric car the top speed isn't massive the zero to 60 isn't going to set the world on fire and you look at it and go oh, it's going to be no fun to drive at all it's going to be a bit plain and a bit vanilla it's really not it's actually quite nice and it's road matters once you are on a flow once you are through some nice bits of nice road and uh, i've met some traffic it's a very impressive car my challenge with driving all evs on press days is you only get a tiny glimmer of what they're like you just get this it's quite frustrating really because you get this this tiny taster I guess it's like wine tasting and you have to spit the wine back into a spittoon and what you really want to do is neck the bottle. Although that's probably not a particularly good uh, metaphor for, <laughs> for driving. Let's just put the drink driving thing to one side. I'd like to spend more time with this car. Um, it's the first, well actually no, I have driven a Renault Zoe a few years ago now, but it's the first you know, really modern um, uh, Renault EV I've driven. I had the Renault Akana as a Hendy the Group long term, but that was a hybrid. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with the electric drivetrain and the performance. And I'm really impressed with the interior. I really quite like all of the infotainment system and that kind of infotainment system, that would maybe even wean me off of Apple CarPlay and Waze navigation because it really is very good. <laughs> it really is. Um, so yeah, the on the whole, very impressive car. I kind of understand now why it's just one car of the year 2024. But the proof for me will be in the long-term ownership of this car, doing a long journey. You know, it is 300 plus miles achievable. My gut feel says, yes, it is absolutely. The efficiency I'm starting to get in this car, even on a short drive, being reasonably enthusiastic, I'm still in the three and a half miles per kilowatt you hour. Line. You are on the fastest route. You should reach your destination by 16.13. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm you know, three and a half miles per kilowatt hour on this kind of road. If you're in a more sort of you know, busy town, urban driving environment, over four miles per kilowatt hour, I would have thought no problem whatsoever. It's comfortable, it's modern, there's space, there's a lot of space inside, and I love the roof, it's very airy in here. So yeah, all in all, to start with a very impressive car, it's difficult, I haven't found a great deal I don't like about it, to be honest, but I need to live with one for a bit longer, I need to really put one through its paces and go on a long journey and try out that navigation system, try out all of the, um, the, the clever um, downloadable widgets and so on. Uh, put in the comments what your thoughts are on the new Renault Scenic. Anyway, I'm going to head on back uh, to the hotel um, and hand this car back. But if you enjoyed that, please give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come. And I'll see you on the next film. You take care, guys. Drive safe.